We're calling out false NDEs right here on Encounter Today. I wasn't a believer in near-death experiences until I had my own. We want to see who's being exalted in, in the story that's being shared. People who can prove, validate through hospital records that they have clinically died. Everybody wants to know what happens after they die. They want to know what's on the other side. Because we've learned from hell experiences, the enemy, the devil and his minions, will use trickery. They will mimic these idyllic sites. Sean Tabbitt, Randy Kay, good to have you guys back on Encounter today. Great to be with you. Thank you. Alan, well, I always enjoy it. <laughs> it is. Well, Sean, we're all, it's like we talk every day. Pretty much. Um, but Randy, <laughs> it's been way too long since we've had a chance to talk. And I'm so excited to talk with you two gentlemen because you guys have collaborated on this. NDE project, near death experience project, where you have put together more than a hundred stories uh, about the afterlife, heaven, hell, more than that, out of body experiences, all that kind of stuff, which we're going to get into. But first, both of you approached this subject, or at least came to an interest in this subject through two very different means. And I want to find out how did this begin? How did this fascination begin? Sean, we'll start with you. Where, where, when did you dive into this and get so interested into these near-death experiences? Well, I have to blame probably Randy and John Burke would be the culprits who took me down this rabbit hole. Uh, really, my first exposure to the near-death experience space was working on Randy's book, Dying to Meet Jesus. And uh, I was a part of getting that book ready for launch and had read the book. And I, honestly, I was a little bit skeptical uh, about all this space NDEs, out-of-body experience, that kind of a thing. Uh, but ironically, I left the publisher I was with before that book ever went to market. And Randy and I reconnected, and we did an interview that went viral and had a few million views. And that has spurred this whole trajectory of Randy and me doing tons of content, working on multiple books together. And um, I have, since probably the past three and a half years, been deep in this rabbit hole, and I continue to play here and enjoy it. And so... Uh, I blame Randy mostly for, for well, helping me to get to this Sean, space. how many books do you think you've done, Sean, about this subject matter or been involved with in some way, shape, or form? Uh, at this point, probably, I would say seven or eight Wow, would, would be my guess at this point. So, But Rand, Randy's was the first one that I really had intentionally spent time working on and thinking about. And Randy, you, you have come to this in a very personal way. Very quickly, share your testimony of... Um, how this subject matter became of interest to you. Well, I wasn't a believer in near-death experiences until I had my own. And uh, I was a writer of, I had written uh, articles for Forbes magazine and, and others. I'd been uh, in the business world. And so I was at, invited to God TV for some research we had done on thriving in life, you know, and it was the first validated uh, project on, on how a person could thrive in life. So I was invited to God TV and only a handful of people knew about my near death experience. I'd, you know, 14 years, and I didn't share it publicly. And so the person interviewing me happened to be a former pastor who did know about my near death experience. And he said, I'd like you to, I'd like to ask you about it. And I said, well, are you sure this is of the Lord? And he said, well, I think so. So he asked me about it, and that was the first time on God TV that I shared my experience because I never wanted to make it public. Uh, and afterwards, he said, well, don't worry, it's only gone out to about 300 million people. And I said, well, the cat's out of the bag. I guess, uh, I guess that's, you know, Lenore telling me that I, he wants me to share publicly. And then Sean and I got uh, connected with a number of different people uh, many of whom are in the book, uh, Near-Death Experiences. And then I felt a commonality, but uh, like Sean, uh, John Burke actually helped me to introduce this subject because we had lunch in San Diego, California. And uh, it was the first time I'd shared my story to somebody who I really didn't know. And I did not have a bite to eat for lunch. I was, I was tearing up, crying profusely. It was, it was entirely embarrassing because I was sharing this to somebody who actually believed in my story, which I didn't think people would. 
Um, and I, I just, and then, uh, that's how that connection happened. And the rest is, uh, is history as they say. Uh, you two gentlemen have actually authored previous books together, uh, stories of heaven and the afterlife, which we've discussed and talked about in the past. And now this one, and you, you both mentioned the skepticism surrounding these experiences. People are legitimately skeptical for these things. And now with this book, more than a hundred stories that will help you understand heaven, hell, and the afterlife, you guys have had the chance to process and go through just bukus of these so-called experiences to filter out what's legitimate, and what's not legitimate. So I wanted to ask you this, how do we know just offhand? I'm sure you've got it. You've got a, you have a, you have a quick way of doing this. When you run across a story that you feel is not legitimate, what are the signs of an illegitimate NDE? And let's start with uh, Sean. Yeah, one of the things Randy and I are often looking for in terms of a story is, is it biblically sound? Is it Christ honoring? Uh, we we, we want to see who is being exalted in, in the story that's being shared. Is the person sharing the story being ex- exalted? Or is the posture of the person sharing that, Jesus is just the best thing in the whole world. And so you're, you're really looking for, uh, in, in terms of that, that solid perspective, who, wh- what are they promoting? Who are they calling you to? Because um, at the end of the day, these stories should be one of the biggest and best evangelistic tools that we have to share because people are coming back with, with experiences in hell, experiences in heaven. They've encountered the Father. They've encountered Jesus. Um, you know, the, these stories really lend a credibility to what we read in the scriptures and what our eternal hope is. And so uh, what for me, one of the hallmarks is, you know, is it biblically sound? And then the other would be, who's being exalted? If, if it's not the Lord, I'm a little concerned. Mm. Yeah. Randy, what, what are your uh, keys for marking a, 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 or that disqualifies an NDE for you? Yes. Well, we actually have a question here uh, that the person answers to tell us about their story. And then we have a pre-qualifying interview with someone else. So we have, by the time it gets to uh, me, we've had uh, at least two interviews from others who have a gift of discernment uh, and also are are grounded in the Word of God uh, to ensure there aren't conflicts with the Word of God. And so then it gets to me. And oftentimes I will have a kind of a a pre-conversation, if you will, with that person and I have, I, I guess you would say, kind of a unique uh, advantage in speaking with someone because I've been there. And so when I check their story, I'm checking against what, what I, not only what I experience, but at this point, uh, you know, we have a bullish amount of uh, interviews and people and friends who have gone through these experiences uh, to validate how uh, not necessarily cohesive they are in terms of the same story, because they're very different. However, the ones that really align in terms of the most important things, and the most important things are those that are consistent with both God's Word and also not in conflict with God's Word. Mm. And finally, there is this, um, this, this sense of, of uh, to Sean's point, of who it honors, because uh, the Lord had spoken early on to me and actually to my wife as well, and he said, I want you to take back the narrative. I didn't understand what that meant, uh, and then I understood that the, the space was dominated by New Age uh, stories, people who were talking about you know, all kinds of wacky things, and uh, they weren't God-honoring. And so I... How do I express this without sounding haughty? Because I don't mean to. I believe that there's a certain degree of anointing that goes into um, into uh, deciphering through these stories to what I call more uh, an assessment of how much that person loves God, how fully devoted that person is to God. Because when you come back from heaven, especially, I can't speak to hell, but the, you know, people get the hell scared out of them. When you come back from heaven, you are changed. You are transformed. I can't speak about it without, without um, 
a break in my emotions, I can't do that. And I want to see that. I want to see that from others. I want to see them broken, broken from their experience. Wow. And you can only imagine, ladies and gentlemen, this book, Near-Death Experiences, 101 Short Stories that'll help you understand heaven, hell, and the afterlife, how they've combed through dozens for each one they pull out through that screen. And these are stories that are going to not only encourage you, but uplift and honor what it is you know uh, from the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I, it's very fascinating to me that we're we're entering into a space, a very supernatural space in the American zeitgeist where it's, there seemed to have been for a time this drift into secularism, this drift into materialism, and that the, the what we can see is all that there is. But all of a sudden, there's this heightened awareness of evil. There's this heightened awareness of spiritual things from aliens. You mentioned hijacking the narrative, in a sense. And that's uh, something that I'm very passionate about in regard to aliens and artificial intelligence and the antichrist and all this kind of stuff, demons and demonology is now floating around. And I love how, as you guys have dived into this subject in this book, you break it up into sections, which I was surprised by some of these sections. Number one is the afterlife. I wasn't surprised by that. Certainly looking forward to that. Um, out of body experiences. I want us to talk about that here in a second. Heightened senses, encountering other beings, uh, life flashing before your eyes, essentially, trips to heaven or hell, side effects of the NDEs. And I thought that was really interesting how you broke down the table of contents and you separated these stories into these categories. So let's dive into one of the most controversial, which is out-of-body experiences. This is something that, that Christians are going to gonna need a fainting couch the moment you start to talk about these things. Um, how do you approach this subject? Because when people hear that, they think New Age, they think astral projection, they think all that demonic stuff. How do you approach this biblically? So when you're talking about out-of-body experiences, what are you referring to? And let's start with uh, Randy this time. Well, I think it's important to distinguish between an afterlife experience and a near-death experience. Because when we talk about an out-of-body experience, technically speaking, uh, biotechnolo biotechnology tells us that, that once the heart stopped, stops, then there is no brain. The brain ceases. It dies, essentially. And the studies show that, you know, it takes at the outlier uh, up to six minutes, but typically less than that in a matter of seconds. So when we talk about an afterlife experience, we're talking about somebody who clinically died. And the definition for death is when the heart stops. And so the heart stops, the brain cannot no longer function uh, the vast majority, if not all of those with whom we have interviewed, have said heaven is more real than this life. I concur with that uh, from my experience. So uh, the Bible says absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So at that point, the spirit, the born again spirit, for those who have an experience in heaven, um, has only one place to go. Um, and it's not going to be uh, abiding in a dead body. And most of those accounts, many of those accounts that, that we uh, showcase are people who can prove, validate through hospital records, including yours truly, that they have clinically died. It's been, it's been verified by hospital staff members. So at that point, for the afterlife experience, not the near death, because the near death experience, the mind is still active. It can imagine things. It can perhaps even fabricate things. But in the afterlife experience, then, the conundrum that I think the church has is, where's the evidence in the Bible? Uh, and we look to Paul, of course, is, is clearly one case, you know, talking about the third heaven, um, he was stoned, we believe, in Lystra. We don't know if his experience followed that stoning or not, but it could could have been. He said he didn't know if he was in the body or out of the body. So he validated through the word of God that it could have been one or the other. And of course, there was uh, what we, we term kind of the first uh, afterlife or, or near-death experience account within the Bible was Stephen, who was being stoned and saw heaven. 
Um, and we have other instances as well. There's the parable that uh, Jesus gave of the rich man and, and Lazarus, the poor man. You know, one was in heaven and one was in hell. So there are evidences. And I think most importantly for the body of Christ to understand would be that there's not a contradiction in the Bible to these experiences. Um, it, there's not uh, the level of detail that many of our experiences have, but I would propose this that God is revealing these accounts in detail because of these last days. He is bringing heaven to earth. For ages we have prayed that prayer. Thy will be done on on earth as it is in heaven. He has heard those prayers. He is opening heaven to come to earth. He is expressing these stories. They are both prophetic in nature. They are telling what has been, uh, what has been, Earth, uh, what has been unearthed from heaven, uh, created in heaven, poured down on earth. And these who are coming forth, professing these things, what they have experienced in heaven, are those who are prophetically speaking forth what God has ordained in heaven so that we can be prepared and live accordingly in these last days for, um, for being more heavenly minded than earthly minded. Wow, that's so good, that distinction between a near-death experiences and afterlife experiences. Sean, what would you like to add to that after all your research into these dozens upon dozens of stories? Well, and, uh, I do like that you read off some of the sections or the way we divide up the book. One of the things that we're trying to do in terms of taking back the narrative is on the Christian publishing side of this conversation, you don't see nearly as many authors talking about uh, spe- specific terms like was this uh, just an NDE? Was it a distressful or a disturbing NDE? Uh, you know, differentiating between somebody who, you know, maybe had uh, an, a, an experience that was more of like a dream or a vision, but they had all the hallmarks of an NDE. Um, and then dividing it into these kind of nine points uh, that, that kind of follows the, the trajectory of most NDE experiences. Um, we really wanted to start giving this side of the conversation language and structure to have uh, better conversations to be able to t- tell these stories better and share them better. Um, and so that, that really has been the whole focus of, of this book. It's very out of the box. Some of the feedback we've received from readers is that, well, this was different because uh, there people are often expecting, Oh, those are some nice stories that I read. I heard about heaven and we're, we're really trying to arm people with the vocabulary to have a better conversation uh, around what's happening in these afterlife encounters. Uh, but in terms of just the, the out of body experience, uh, that, that's the second stage that we define in the book. And really, that's that period after somebody, they dies, they had a, have a, or they, they're they in the process of dying in the midst of a catastrophic event, and their their spirit being, so to speak, is pulled out of their body or it leaves their body. And sometimes it's a very short encounter where uh, you're sort of in between the space here on Earth and crossing that veil, so to speak, to to what's on the other side. That can be very short. Or it can be very long and drawn out where people are interacting with their environment. People are often confused. They're trying to talk to people, might try to touch their dog or turn the light switch on and their hand will go through the dog or, or go through the wall. Um, I think probably my favorite uh, out-of-body experience is Captain Dale Black. He dies in this plane crash and he's floating above the crash site, sees everything that's happening there. And then he kind of follows his ambulance all the way to the hospital, can see what's happening in the ambulance. And then he's in the, one of the trauma bays in the emergency room, watching them work on his body. And he even hears one of, his, one of the co-pilots that was in the plane with him have this hor- horrific experience where we, we think he was actually being taken into hell, is what it, what it sounds like from how Dale describes it. But he had a very prolonged uh, out-of-body experience versus some people, it's it's very short. But that's that's that space in between leaving the body before you kind of cross that veil to the other side. Yeah, we actually interviewed Dale Black, and we have that available on Encounter Today. We'll we'll post the link to that in the description of this video so people can get all the details, ask him all kinds of amazing questions. Plus, uh, we have a kind of behind the scenes, if I'm not mistaken, Evan, a premium interview with Dale Black that people can check out at EncounterToday.com just for our premium members. And we're going to have a an uncensored conversation with you guys over there here in just a moment. And I want to talk about some actual stories that jump out to you at the book here, here soon. But you both have mentioned, uh, Randy, the importance of building your vocabulary for 
these afterlife experiences before you dive into having this conversation. Why do you think that's so important? And what are the three things you would say, here's what you need to know, here's what you need to understand before we dive into these stories? Okay, well, that sounds like an easy question. So (laughs) (laughs) first thing I think you need to know is that um, you need to be conversant with the Bible. Uh, because if you're not conversant with the Bible, anyone can trick your, your mind. Um, because we've learned from hell experiences that the, uh, the enemy, the devil and his minions will use trickery. They will mimic these idyllic sites, these idyllic manifestations. And you have a myriad of people who are talking about things. And if you don't know your, your word, the word of God, mm. you can't benchmark all of what they say against whether this is indeed both in the word of God and consistent, if not, uh, if not, if not elucidated through the words in the Bible. Wow. The, the second thing, besides being grounded in the word of God and knowing, uh, knowing how to, um, to judge whether it is uh, of God or not, is to be, uh, to be in prayer during, during the story itself. That is, um, Lord, ask the Lord God, is this, is, this, is this you? Is this you? Is this of you? Um, because the Lord, I believe, will impart that, uh, that understanding um, because there's a level of discernment, and I pray a gift of discernment for anyone who listens to these stories, that there is a discernment. Does this resonate in my spirit as true? Is there anything that I believe kind of is a check mark, is something that doesn't, um, doesn't seem right? You know, the person usually, uh, usually is self-aggrandizing. Um, that's one of the things the Lord told me. He said to me, that is, he said, I don't want it to be all about you. He said, that's why, you know, I love working with Sean because we brought other people's stories and therefore it was an amalgamation of stories. So it had been, didn't become about all about us. And I think Dale, uh, as you said, when you, when you interviewed him, that he's a person who would defer. He's very deferential. He's very humble about his story. So the second, that's the second one. The third one and final one, I believe, is that which is more, more looking at the character of the individual. Uh, and it goes back to the humility of the individual uh, himself or herself. Um, and that is somebody uh, who is self-aggrandizing is going to couch those words such that they are the oracle of truth. Hmm. And they'll actually say that. that then, and, and you'll see the interviews that will happen where they're talking about new age elements and demonic uh, that is all of a sudden light and reincarnation and, and uh, mumbo jumbo uh, stuff, false stuff like that, is they will, they will couch it as the truth teller. In other words, listen to me. We had somebody that we, Sean and I interviewed, who... Um, uh, who wrote a, a four page email because we weren't going to uh, showcase this person as to why people didn't understand him. You know, basically he was saying, I know the truth. You guys don't, but you, you hear from those who are presenting a story through a God honoring way. And they're saying something like this. These are the kind of the words they'll say. They'll say, test the spirits. They'll say, um, the Lord um, uh, asked me to share this, to bring cl- people closer to him, um, to bring him closer, to bring that person listening to the story closer to God's word. Uh, and also, you'll hear the vernacular like, um, I, you know, I did not deserve this. I, I, I am not special. I am not someone who is even able to speak forth the glory of God because I'm not capable of doing that. All of these deferential things, you'll hear those words of those who are conveying a story which God has authored and only God could do versus one who is uh, presenting something 
that is of the world or uh, of even even Satan and his minions are presenting to deceive people. I love it. We're calling out false NDEs right here on Encounter Today. <laughs> this is great, though, for discernment. This conversation so far has been so phenomenal. If you guys agree with that, let us know in the comments what you're getting out of this, because there's, I think there's going to be more experiences like this. Not only that, dreams, visions, and what, what Randy's laying out, what Sean is laying out can be applied to all of these things. That number one, we go back to the word. Number two, we look at all of these things that they've mentioned to see whether or not it is of the Lord. Sean, is there anything you want to add to what he shared? Yeah, just uh, the in terms uh, in terms of building a, a vocabulary and being able to discuss competently. I think there is some productive space in conversing with the other side of the conversation. Some of those folks that Randy has mentioned um, that had more new age sorts of experience. There are large organizations and big movements. Uh, over there. It is a dark space, but I think if God calls you to minister in that space, there's a lot of uh, ministry to be done there. So in terms of immersing yourself in, in kind of the, the NDE afterlife space, just just realize in terms of conversing with people, this is a universal interest. Everybody wants to know what happens after they die. They want to know what's on the other side. Uh, so in terms of a conversation starter, almost everybody has some level of interest in this topic. Uh, also, very culturally relevant. You look at the glut of ghost shows and psychic shows and all kinds of crazy stuff. When you start to go down this rabbit hole, there's all kinds of crazy overlap when it comes to ghosts and aliens and all these sorts of things. It all sort of converges in this afterlife space. And so mm. uh, there is a strong, broad, accepted cultural interest and conversation that's happening all the time about these sorts of topics. It's just coming at it from a slightly different angle. Um, and, and then the other thing I would I would just want to remind people is being able to be competent in talking about this stuff, it provides hope for hard times. And we really saw a huge response to our early content during COVID time. There were just people who had friends and loved ones that had passed away. They wanted to be, know that they had made it to the other side. That would come up a lot. Um, you know, a lot of conversation and questions about for people who had committed suicide. There's a lot of worries. Is that loved one on the other side? Um, I can say from my wife's and my own journey with her, her cancer experience that we're still going through, having had so many conversations with people who've been to heaven and, you know, just having talked to so many people about what their dying process and that process of stepping over, it's just brought a lot of fruitful and production conversation between my wife and myself. So, you know, there's, there's actually a lot of ministry opportunities, places the Lord can use you if you get conversant and comfortable uh, in the vocabulary of the space and just being able to uh, share. I think the Lord will bring to mind some of these stories that you can share with somebody to really touch to meet a need that they have. So it's, you know, it's fascinating. It's really intriguing to learn about these heaven and hell stories. Uh, but don't forget, there's a real ministry opportunity here as well. Wow. Yeah. These are conversations that we avoid like the plague or like Madonna avoids soap and water. These are things we don't want anything to do with. <laughs> um, and we wait until we're faced with it. And then often it's, it's not that it's too late. It's just, we would be much more equipped if we talked about these things and dug into the Word of God and understood that our hope is not in this world, if our hope is in this world alone, then we are, we are, we are miserable people. Uh, but our hope is in resurrection, that there's something after this life. And that's why books like this are so empowering, especially when it's rooted in the Word of God. I want to get to some of these stories, but first I want to ask you about the side effects of NDEs. This sounds, this sounds really interesting. It reminds me of Flatlanders, or sometimes they come back, or Pet Cemetery. What are whenever you guys have an entire section of the book on side effects of NDEs? What are you talking about? Let's start with Sean. Boy, that, that's that's a loaded part of the book. Um, a lot of it has to do with the changes that the near death experiencer has on the other side of their journey. One thing to keep in mind, and this this comes out of Dr. Jeffrey Long's research, it takes a about on average seven years for somebody to fully come to terms with what the, with what they experience. So, um, you know the hmm. the lingering effects may mount up over time uh, in terms of changes. Um, I would say on the one hand, the folks who've had more of a distressing or disturbing NDE or a hell experience, we've encountered people where um, they've they've needed they've got PTSD. You know, we've had people where they have a god a god encounter that helps them get past it. Other people, I think probably need some kind of counseling or something to get past it. So there can be a real 
difficult aspect there. Um, for the people who have uh, the heaven experiences, they're just immersed in God's loves. And so their personality, their character, who they are, uh, changes. Uh, you know, there can be difficulties on the other side where they so don't care about the things that drove their life before, the things they were pursuing, their job, their career, money, you name it. Um, that all of a sudden becomes unimportant uh, to the point where they, maybe they can't continue in their job. It might break up their marriage because all of a sudden this person is completely different. So there, there's all kinds of interesting uh, things that happen after somebody has one of these experiences where they're just so night and day different. Um, and, and I would say the other, the other thing I'll, I'll mention and then let Randy get into his answers um, is just so many people have a burden for the lost. Uh, I think my favorite is probably Ian McCormick, who got stung by five box jellyfish while, while diving. His, I mean, you can just see it on his face. His burden to minister to and reach the lost is like nothing I, I, don't, I don't think we've seen with any of our other guests. So for many of our friends who've been to heaven, uh, their burden just to spread the gospel and reach people, like it's a fire. That, that burns in them. So the, the after effects, what changes, it can be very broad depending on the type of experience that you had, depending on who you were before you went into that journey. Uh, but people are profoundly marked. Um, I, I think the, 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 that profound marking is a real whole hallmark of a true near-death experience. Yeah, Randy, what would you like to add to that, the side effects of the NDEs? Well, uh, several of these people gave up a lot in their own career. Uh, to share these uh, stories. You know, there are those who um, essentially sacrificed, uh, you know, whether they were business executives, whether they were uh, pilots, as in you said, Dale Black, uh, those who came from a very um, kind of a successful worldly uh, background who knowingly sacrificed some of that reputation, if you will, for sharing something that they knew would be scrutinized, and in many cases, uh, they would be ridiculed. But here's an interesting thing, I think, for this, uh, talking about side effects, and, and Sean talked about the fact that you had people then coming, just their entire lives were transformed. Um, I would say that uh, one side effect is being conversant with the Lord, more conversant with the Lord. In other words, um, many of these uh, with whom we've interviewed and, and know, including yours truly, um, weren't necessarily uh, what I would call on fire Christians going into the experience, but coming back, it was just a fire burning within. I mean, and you can understand that obviously being before uh, the Lord God in heaven, what that the effect that it would have. But here's the the flip side of that: that many came back. And, and when I say many, I'm including myself as well. Many came back um, somewhat depressed uh, because of the diametrical opposition between heaven and this world. You can well imagine when, and this speaks to why, you know, God uh, had de devised um, the means for people who had passed on from this life, loved ones who had gone on to heaven, who cannot communicate with their loved ones. Well, God built a firewall, I suppose, so to speak, between heaven and this world. Because those in heaven are not reminded uh, of the, the pain, the suffering in this world, and all of those things that would cause a degree of, of um, sadness. Uh, so coming back from that, to this world evokes all of those things which are totally divorced from the afterlife survivors in heaven. So all of a sudden there's just a truckload of these things coming in. There's, there's a, a remembrance of how idyllic and how wonderful, the most wonderful being in the presence of God um, versus the diametrical opposition of being in this world. And all of a sudden, my spirit having been freed, where I had adopted what Paul called the mind of Christ, where I could think and see almost through the eyes of Christ and just see people in a whole different light as, as Jesus sees them, to now coming back and the the, the sullied mind is now filtering through everything. And all of a sudden, one of the, I'll, I'll end with this. 
one of the most striking things when I was, when, when the nurse, I was a nurse and she said, Mr. K, can you hear me? And I'd been resuscitated. <laughs> and, and the, this is the one that stuck out. I could smell the acrid smell of the chemicals in that room. And of course the, the, my, my chest was pained because it had been defibrillated. I could, I could realize that in opposition of what was in heaven, which were the beautiful fragrances, the beautiful, oh my Lord, the beautiful fragrances, the, the, and, and what happened was I was hearing before he came back, the angel singing because the Lord told me I would come back. And I said, okay, Lord, I don't want to. And I, and I woke up in this, in this hospital bed with people surrounding me. And, and, and there was a couple by my bedside that were praying for me. And, and you know what? That same song that I heard in heaven was being sung by this couple by my bedside that, that somehow God had ushered forth the prayers of the, the saints those two people, a couple by my bedside were being ushered forth into heaven and joined by, and joined by the angels and poured down on earth. And somehow this dynamic brought forth this, this life to, to assuage me of what I had lost. Wow. The profound, profound and unique evangelistic position of stories like you just told, Randy, I think all of you watching need to understand that everyone you know who's not saved, who has fallen away from the Lord, this is at the top of their minds. And they may not say it, they may not show interest in it, but if you were to slide this book across the desk to them, if you were to place it in the mail and send it to them, if you were to give it as a gift to them, I can promise you when no one else is around, they're going to crack it open. And they're going to discover stories that point them to the reality of who Jesus is, how they can encounter him, and how they can be ready for heaven. And I don't think there's too many things more important that we could do right now heading into 2024. So we're going to put the link to this book in the description, Near Death Experiences, 101 Short Stories That Will Help You Understand Heaven, Hell, and the Afterlife. There in the description. Here in a moment, I want to ask you guys about your favorite stories in the book because you've gone through between the two of you hundreds and you've distilled it down to 101 stories for this book. I want to pull those out. We're going to do that over on the premium side of the uncensored conversation. Guys, if you're watching this and you want to hear these stories, go over to encountertoday.com and just become a premium member. What does that mean? You just say, I want to be a part of the encounter family. That's all that means. The first month is a dollar. So just go over there. The reason is we're getting rid of all the riffraff and we're able to have uncensored conversations and really do discipleship over there. And we don't have to worry about the algorithm and, and censorship and all that kind of stuff. So that's at EncounterToday.com. Check that out. But I want to ask you two gentlemen, uh, starting with you, Sean, why would you ask people to go get that book? Who is this book for? I think on the one hand, this book is for you because you want to know what happens when you get to the other side. I mean, we saw this, the interest in this topic surge throughout the COVID time frame. I think as we look to what we know is likely on the horizon in 2024, we are entering into some hard times. And when you enter into hard times, people need hope. People are worried. Uh, you know, I think we're going to see a lot more death and mayhem on the horizon on a, a global scale. And so uh, you need a hope of heaven. We all need that hope of heaven as we face hard times. Uh, like I said earlier, in terms of my wife's situation, it's that hope of heaven that's kept us going for 17 months as we've navigated the murky waters of this journey. So so on the one hand, I think it's for, for you, the person listening to or watching this. And then as Alan just said a few moments ago, uh, for that friend who you're not sure how to reach them, you're not sure how to break through to them, yet if you just have the Holy Spirit prompting you that you know what, if I give them a copy of this book, they might actually pick up it and read it. Um, you know, I found more often than not throughout my life, when, when the Holy Spirit is giving you a little prompt, if you just take an action uh, with such a simple thing like sending a book, uh, you'd be amazed at the eternal difference that can make in somebody's life. Yeah, buy multiple copies, multiple copies, and just hand it out like candy. Randy, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, well, ditto to what Sean said. And uh, 
Also, I think anyone that's gone through uh, a loss of a loved one, a uh, grieving process, um, anyone who is diagnosed with a uh, terminal illness or serious illness. Um, and I would say this, that uh, these stories, uh, and, and I've talked to a number of people with Sean, uh, have an evangelical impact like nothing else. And so, whereas the the, the non-believer, let's say, uh, would not listen to a scriptural based book, you know, or they may they may read it and it would certainly be changed by the word of God. But if they if they say the person wouldn't set one foot in church, they will listen to or read these stories. Um, and and the and the proof is in the pudding. I mean. These are impacting people in Muslim countries. We've had uh, people who, uh, from different religions, all religions, by the way, who have been impacted by these stories, and they would have never heard it otherwise. Yeah. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to bless you. And people will read it. These short stories, you can just get through them really, really quick, are so impactful and uh, so illuminating, especially when you lay them alongside Scripture and you let Scripture be the plumb line as you journey through the pages of the book, it's going to be a great blessing for you. Near-Death Experiences, 101 Short Stories. The link is in the description. Get it, and then go over to EncounterToday.com where we're going to talk about their favorite stories uh, with our premium members. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. God bless. Yeah, our pleasure. Head on over to EncounterToday.com, and if you love coffee, go to EncounterCoffee.com and get our latest blend, the Azusa Street Mornings, or the Wigglesworth blend, I think it'd be a blessing to you. We'll see you over at EncounterToday.com. I think Christians are tired of supporting woke companies with their dollars when they take those dollars and support agendas that are antithetical to what we believe as Christians. That's why it's important for the body of Christ to raise up a parallel economy. That's one of the reasons why we've started our own coffee company right here at Encounter Ministries, where you can get some exciting blends like our brand new one. I'm really excited about this one. Azusa Street Mornings, where you can get your morning outpouring, where we give honor to William Seymour. And on the back of the coffee bag, there's some facts and information about Azusa Street, about William Seymour, because we want to build your faith. And speaking of faith, we also have the Wigglesworth blend, where it's awakening faith. And these are amazing, actually. They they taste amazing. They're going to be your favorite coffee, and they make great gifts. With every brew, you become a part of a movement that transcends a morning routine. Together, we're brewing revival, awakening hope, and delivering love one cup at a time. You can select from whole bean or ground as many bags as you can for yourself and for your family and support the preaching of the gospel.